Today we're going to talk about the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Uh, one of the most dangerous topic to talk about here on YouTube. I assume you guys know why. I'm going to introduce to you guys an unknown Chinese guest here. I also hope you guys understand why I choose to conceal his identity because I don't want to reveal something he said and got his channel banned. But like I said, I'm here to uh, display the Chinese perspective of the ongoing events around the world. And the ongoing conflict right now in the Middle East is an important one. So at the end, I would like to put forward also some of my own thoughts and opinion. In addition, I also hope I can get a pro-Israel audience or preferably uh, Israeli living in Israel to contact me in the comment section or by email. I have my email link in my channel description. I have many people on my email loops, uh, Ukrainians, Russians, Taiwanese. I love to hear stories from all sides and angles, so just to keep myself informed. So this is a Chinese broadcast uh, happened earlier this week. Um, the channel has over a million subscribers. Let's see what they said. Oh, they are pleased. Ladies and gentlemen, order. Order, please. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't intend to come here this year. My country is at war. To begin, I suggest my audience to watch both the Biden speech and the Netanyahu speech from the official UN website, the uncensored version that is. And you will witness the ugliest side of international politics. It is unimaginable that the President of the United States of America can give a speech in the United Nations that is so hypocritical and dishonest. In fact, I personally feel more disgusted listening to the Biden speech than the Netanyahu speech. In Chinese, we call Netanyahu a truly despicable person, someone who openly embraced being immoral or dishonorable. But we call Biden a hypocrite who pretend to be virtuous. You can dislike Israel, but it is Biden representing the United States of America that made United Nations feel completely hopeless regarding the ongoing event in the Middle East. On the other hand, you see Netanyahu stating that none of the things ongoing in the Middle East is Israel's fault. Everyone else is to blame. Israel is the victim here. Israel has the highest moral standard in the world, and so on. Netanyahu stated all Israel's enemy in the Middle East and claiming that Israel's arm and weapons can reach them no matter where they hide. That Israel's future is a blessing to the Middle East. It's truly a sight that in today's world, when so many countries feel extremely uncomfortable being in the same room with Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu and chose to walk out of the UN General Assembly room. The President of the United States of America somehow being the only leader in the world that chose to openly embrace Israel and its ongoing actions. Even the Vice President of the EU, Joseph Burrell, said that today, no one can stop Netanyahu or Israel. What he really trying to say is that if America don't try to stop Israel and in fact supplying majority of Israel's weaponry and ammunition, who else can stop Israel? We're truly entering a chaotic world and chaotic era 
filled it with uncertainty. Part of the reality is that U.S. election is in less than two months, and no presidential candidate want to offend Jewish lobbyists before that. Harris chose to skip Netanyahu's speech, and half of Democrats did not attend the speech in Congress back in July. What we are looking at is both political parties in the United States, instead of trying to de-escalate the situation in the Middle East, choose to back it instead. Netanyahu's government understands that this is the most vulnerable moment of the United States. U.S. has no other options but to back the military operations in the Middle East by Israel. Yes, Israel's military might surpass many of its regional rivalries, but can such military action really bring peace to Israel and the Middle East? Past experience have shown us that hatred will only give birth to more hatred. By killing one enemy, you create ten. Israel's military tactic, this tactic of "I rather kill a hundred innocent than miss one guilty." What kind of peace will come out of that? The world is not blind. We can see who's backing Israel. Without the United States of America, Israel's extreme aggression will not continue. Now let me put forward my observation on this. Okay, you know when it comes to the Ukrainian war, I can find quite a few Chinese geopolitical commentators that are pro-Ukraine. I might even feature one of them in my future video, but I seriously cannot find a single Chinese、uh, commentator right now that is pro-Israel in the, this current conflict. Not a single one. So, if there's any Chinese who's watching this video and you know one, please let me know. I want to watch their video. Even the most anti-CPC Chinese commentators, okay, here on YouTube, who demonize China, you know, twenty-four-seven, uh, they they choose either to ignore the Israel issue completely or suggest China sh should stay out. Of the trouble in the Middle East. So, if you know anybody knows such person exists, please let me know. Sometimes, I mean, the way they choose to ignore or avoid the Middle East topics kind of suggests that they are paid actress, or maybe they understand the golden rule of if you want to make money here on YouTube, you better not say anything bad about Israel. So when it comes to Ukrainian war, I said that majority of the Chinese、uh, is Russian leaning at the moment. When it comes to the Middle East problem right now regarding Israel Palestine, almost all Chinese who are engaged and aware of、uh, geopolitical issues right now they are anti-Israel, all of them, basically. So. Since I do not cover the Middle East conflict that often, I want to use this opportunity to let you guys know how how the Chinese political analysts think、uh, in general regarding、uh, the Middle East. I'm not gonna reveal any names, of course. Okay, I'm gonna go down the list here. These are, I would say, consider more common understanding right now among Chinese elites. Okay, first, the United States of America as of now. And for the foreseeable future, unfortunately, we、we'll、back Israel no matter what. We do not see any alternative on the horizon. Second,、uh, there's very little chance of a short-term political solution, and it really feels like any solution might even end up in more wars.、Um, if you look at the recent news on, I think CNN and PBS. Uh, the Lebanon foreign minister said that they actually agreed to term of peace, but still、uh, Israel went on with the attack into Lebanon. You were you were talking about going into、uh, the Security Council for this ceasefire, and barely 24、yes. hours later,、yeah. the head of Hezbollah was assassinated. Are you saying Hassan Nasrallah had agreed to a ceasefire just 
moments before he was assassinated? He agreed, he agreed, yes, yes. We agreed completely, Lebanon agreed to cease fire, but consulting with, Hez with the Hezbollah, uh, the speaker, Mr. Berry, consulted with Hezbollah, and we informed the Americans and the French that that what happened. So, and they told us and uh, that uh, Mr. Netanyahu also agreed on the statement that was issued by both presidents. Okay, well, as you know, Mr. Netanyahu was also in New York at the time, and he actually said publicly, the IDF must fight on. And then he ordered the assassination uh, and the targeting of that headquarters, which killed, uh, which killed, uh, which killed uh, Nasrallah. So given all of that, I mean, who do you have any faith in if the strongest country in the world, the United States, seems to have no or very little influence after well, publicly saying that there would be a ceasefire? I don't think we have an alternative, yes. So, <laughs> I don't see, sometimes I really fail to see what's the point of negotiation when there's absolutely no trust. And I think some of the issue will just have to be fought out on the battlefield. Now, the third point, the Arab Muslim countries are currently too weak and too divided to act against Israeli aggression. And I've watched many, many Arab YouTube channels. They literally believe more in those protesters on the street of London and US universities across you know, America than trusting their own kings and leaders. So that lead to the fourth point, which uh, the majority of the Chinese right now believe the future of Palestinians and the state of Palestine. Not yet established, but yeah, it is pretty grim. We, we, it's hard for us to see what can push this plan forward of, a, you know, real two-state solution. Now, the last two points here. China is unlikely to involve militarily in the Middle East. Um, this is because China-Israel relationship was pretty good before all this and still is decent, I say, at the moment. And Israel desired the Middle East to be not anti-Israel and not exactly pushing the Middle East to become anti-China. But it might change in the future, of course. In addition, there's really no one to back in the Middle East, um, even if China wants to back a certain state against Israel aggression. It's just too divided. Again, like I said, um, the Muslim countries are too weak at the moment, too disorganized, as you can see over the past few weeks and months. You know, their command system are often deeply infiltrated by Mossad and CIA and all those organizations. So. It's almost it's ineffective and dangerous to engage into you know this kind of deep collaboration unless they can sort these things out themselves. Now the final point here, um, there's also a general worry regarding the future of Iran, because given how useless the UN or the international community is doing to stop Israel's aggression in the greater Middle East. Israel can basically bomb whoever they want, whenever they want. There's no balance there at the moment. So, so this is roughly the common agreement among Chinese geopolitical analysts right now. Okay, now on to my own opinion on this. Um, this is, I would say, when fundamental ideology cl clashes between me and my audience. Since the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, um, the Middle East has been in a nearly constant state of conflict. Now, historically speaking, in the region of Middle East, um, especially in the recent millennium, the region has always been more stable and prosperous under one or two major empires. Uh, the British and the French and now the Americans have been playing this divide and conquer game in the Middle East for over a century now. And the situation right now is pessimistic because uh, the way I see it is the following. Okay, see if you guys agree with me. China wants a long lasting peace in the Middle East. Uh, China wants 
Middle East to become somewhat like Southeast Asia or South America. I, I know those regions have their own problems and issues, but at least there's no active war at the moment. According to how the Chinese approach、uh, the issue from also different angles, theoretically speaking, giving Palestinian an independent state and form a greater regional union should be the best way forward for the Middle East. However, I think many Chinese politician and geopolitical analysts realize how naive、uh, they were for underestimating the United States' determination to maintain a colonial architecture system in the Middle East. Now, the three most core important factor here is this, okay? The first, I and I think is the most important. Okay, the Middle East countries and leaders are too divided at the moment. That's that's my honest opinion, and they are not willing to let go of their own interests or identity to form a greater common union to resist foreign power, and this is generally agreed even among scholars in the Middle East because I watch their channel. The second thing is also very important:、um, that the United States' interest and the Israel's interest is more or less aligned in the region.、Um, I do not always agree with, let's say, Professor John Mearsheimer on this issue of, you know, Israel's interest is in conflict of the United States. I see them more or less similar. Uh, Israel want to remove any anti-Israel government or entity from the region. Especially Iran, and the U.S. on the other hand want to turn everyone there to pro-U.S. and subordinate, and that's vital in resisting China's influence and slow BRICS expansion in, in the coming years. And the pursuit and commitment of the U.S. and Israel is very strong compared to other part- parties here, which brings us to the final core factor. China, although wanting a greater peace in the Middle East, does not want to get involved militarily. No, whether it's sending its own troops or massively supplying weapons to another country to counter Israel, it doesn't seem to be China's plan. And Russia right now is、uh, pinned down in Ukraine, and the current Russia is not the former Soviet Union. So. It has little desire to do what the Soviet Union did around the world, not in that kind of intensity. Of course, Russians can correct me if I'm wrong. If people approach the Middle East situation from the angle of U.S.-China competition, I believe Eric Lee, his interview with Prime Minister of Malaysia, said it very well. Yeah, you know, they, the U.S. is very intent on. Making countries choose sides,、yes. choose their side, and the Chinese are not、uh, interested. So, so I recently, I've been thinking about this, and I said, look, you know, if you refuse to choose sides, you're actually choosing China's side, because China's worldview is that we don't choose sides.、Mm. If you want to protect and preserve the unipolar world, then you have to choose sides. That's very true, and this notion that we are still in. A colonial era ran by the United States. This is something very difficult for some of my Western friends to understand. I can see some Europeans are waking up to this, especially Germans. Recently, most people don't feel that during peacetime and when there's a certain conflict,、uh, you found out that there's a certain upper boundary of what your country can decide and cannot decide, and part of the decision. Does not belong to you. It belongs to, perhaps Washington. So this is a big problem, and that's the same in many countries、uh, in the global south. Saudi Arabia and Iraq, for example, unable to adapt Roman being trade because U.S. just put so much pressure、um, and threat on them, and sometimes straight off military action in Iraq, for example, over the last two years. And then when it comes to China. We're just not a colonial power, and we never discover colonialism in Chinese history. I spent a lot of time 
in my comment section explaining that how China's approach to the world politics is different from the old colonial power, colonial mindset. And finally, I want to say that I really want to talk to uh, my one of my Israeli audience to see what's exactly going in their mind. What do they consider to be the end game in the Middle East? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.